religion can mean to become very religious or devout, to be converted, to resolve to end one's immoral behavior. But it can also mean to become serious about something, usually after a profound experience. Or to get religion can mean to understand religion. And the first three of these are uh, really not applying, I don't think. But the last two uh, do pretty much apply. Uh, for our institutions to become serious about religion would be to start to get religion, and that would be involving starting to understand what these are about. So we have our question before us, how the historic religions are of value to the academy. And we remind ourselves that this historic religion category is one of the three that the Jacobsons have clarified today here that uh, they are using historic along with personal and public religion. The uh, historic religions, I believe, include the 12 living historical religions as they've been identified for the past 90 years now, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Zoroastrianism, Hinduism, Jainism, Sikhism, Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, Shinto, and primitivism, or uh, indigenous religions. So what's the value of these traditional religions for the academy? And in those uh, first two chapters of the second part of the Jacobson's book, they identify two major uh, areas in which contributions are made, namely uh, this business on becoming Ill religiously literate uh, and the, uh, so that students are going to know what world religions are really up to, and also this business about uh, etiquette, to gain interfaith etiquette so that they've learned appropriate ways to interact with those of other faiths. And I won't be going into these, but I, I wouldn't doubt it if there will be occasion for the uh, question and answer time to dig into that a little more. But another way in which the historic religions are valuable, it seems, is that they are a visible, explicit, long-standing form of religion that is accessible for students because they're manifested in a visible manner in the contemporary context. Students might not know a lot of the details of all these 12 historic religions, but they do know about Christian churches and Jewish synagogues and temples and Islamic Muslim mosques and a little about what goes on within those structures. So these historic religions are the first thing that come to mind when uh, our students hear the word religion. And in that sense, they provide a starting point for considering, for, for studying uh, religion. But we have to add rather promptly a further way that these historic religions are of value for the academy. And that is that they uh, provide concrete instances of religion which, through critical study, can disclose the radical ambiguity of religion. And I think this is fairly important. Most students are aware that from their experience or from the news that these religions make negative contributions to the world. In analyzing religion from a critical perspective, the negative aspects of religion are brought to light and acknowledged. And uh, we see their, their negative contributions. However, that scrutiny also leads to the positive aspects of religion. So in pointing out religion's ambiguity, students come to see what might be called the humanity of religion. This ambiguity of religion can be underscored 
in many ways. And one way is by heeding religion's classic critics. I think here of Ludwig Feuerbach's theory of religion as a projection. Uh, Karl Marx's theory of religion as the opiate of the people. Friedrich Nietzsche's theory of religion as gentleness that softens biological, natural aggressiveness of people. Sigmund Freud's theory of religion as a psychological crutch. Emile Durkheim's theory of religion as being the soul of the idea of society. All these criticisms of religion contain some truth. Exposing students to these critiques can highlight religion's negative features, which if avoided in the practice of religion can actually help to cleanse religion of ways it inhibits people from moving into fuller humanity. These critics of religion can be regarded as prophets serving healthy religion, not too dissimilar from the Israelite prophets of old. Students can come to realize that religion needs to be criticized, but that such criticism does not need to be thought of as doing away with the positive and sometimes the beautiful features of religion that are every bit as present as the negative features. Secondly, religion's ambiguity can be seen by heeding what's called the apophatic side of religion as opposed to the cataphatic. The cataphatic is the using the positive terminology to talk about who God is, what God is up to, etc. It's making positive claims where the apophatic is doing more denying of claims about uh, the reality that is being attended to. Uh, apophatic prayer, which wouldn't be making many statements or claims, but sort of being in the presence as opposed to cataphatic prayer. It can be helpful to tend to the negating or denying side of religion, which in the name of the mysteriousness of reality, continually questions religious language. The language of religious knowledge and rational concepts that try to nail down life's mystery with too much scrupulous precision and exactitude. Rational or religious thinkers respecting mystery might claim to know the divine reality, but they would likely also claim that one of divinity's main attributes is its unknowability. Essential to knowing God is to acknowledge that God is unknowable. Students appreciate mystery. It's important to help them realize that religion itself is mindful of the need to place limits on its understandings and its formulations so that religion's mystery is not erased. Thirdly, ambiguity becomes apparent by heeding the multivalency, the multiple meanings of scriptural writings and of religious traditions. This insight has been most persuasively presented by Christian scholars in interpreting the Bible, but it applies to other scriptures as well. The claim is that in every biblical passage, one can identify some way that it is functioning to put down and oppress one group or another. In an ethnic way, sexist, classist, nationalist, or whatever way. It is oppressing somebody. On the other hand, the creative interpreter will be able to identify in every passage some way that it's functioning in an emancipatory or liberating way. It can be seen as serving transformative praxis or action. The interpreter's job 
is to play down the negative meanings of the text and to play up the positive meanings. This is a contemporary view, but St. Augustine said largely the same thing when he contended that any biblical interpretation that affirms the double law of love, love of God and love of others, is an appropriate interpretation, and interpretations that don't affirm that double law of love are inappropriate. Multivalency is present as well within each historic religion. Religious traditions set forth many different ideas and values, and the ambiguity of a given tradition is always experienced by the student who is scrutinizing a tradition in its full complexity. The scholar owes it to students to introduce them to the full sweep of a religion. And this involves including and covering those features that are troublesome. But the treasures ought not be dismissed. Most religions find ways to endorse human freedom and agency and the ultimate significance of loving action. If students appreciate mystery, they also appreciate the notions of freedom and love. Religion is much harder to dismiss if at its heart is found the realities of freedom and love. I'm about out of time, so I'll just mention a last way in which the historic religions are of use, of value to the academy. That is, they provide an opportunity for students to get or to understand religion as a pluriform reality. We've heard from the uh, Jacobsons this uh, statement about the American current context as being marked by pluriformity concerning uh, religion. Pluriform religion is complex and multifaceted because now individuals through personal religion and societies through public religion can be regarded as religious without being connected to a historic religion. The historic religions, and this was pointed out in the, in the uh, slides there on Buddhism and, and Martin Luther King, etc. The historic religions are full of individuals whose intense, passionate, personal religiosity can be lifted up to make meaningful connections with students who regard themselves as being personally religious. Likewise, within the context of historical religions can be found faith communities whose covenant with the culture resulted in the religious framework of meaning and that of the culture becoming one. So these instances uh, in the historic religions can become informative for students to learn more about the personal religion and the public religion that uh, are both pretty regnant in our time. So that's basically it. Uh, our question of the value of religion for the, the academy is an important one. But the questions raised by the pluriformity of religion for the historic religions themselves are maybe more important. Kathy and I, as Brian said, have four kids, ages 46 down to 32. They're all, I would say, wonderful, exceptional, Amazing human beings. <laughs> but none of them is involved in any of the historic religions. They are all personally religious, each in her or his own way. They are strong in character, in their vocations, and their convictions. Observers of public religion would regard each of them as being hearty participants in the public debates of the day, be they cultural or political, 
And each of them has found multiple ways of being civically engaged. And most of their friends are in a similar place uh, in life. So, how do the historic religions, which some of us are a part of, relate to this large and growing ever larger group of people who are into what the Jacobsons call uh, personal and public religion, but not into historic religion. Maybe if the academy comes to value historic religion in the ways we are identifying, this might represent a start in addressing this larger issue as well. And so that'd be a topic that I uh, would like to see us possibly address here today as well. Thank you.